Right. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Great. Doing great. Good morning to those online. Uh, these are my sons, uh, John and James. It's Family Worship Sunday, so I thought uh, they would they could help me tell a couple jokes. Um, what do you think? You want to hear some jokes? All right. Say your name and then say your joke. My name is Josh's son. <laughs> Yes, that's true. But you can also call me James. Yes. But my real name is Josh's son. <laughs> hey, I'll take that as an identity over you. That's good. All right. A joke. They want to, the people want to hear a joke. Leave them hanging. What do you call a person without a body or a face? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody, no face, nobody knows. Good. That's awesome. My name is John Siders, um, and my joke is, how does Darth Vader like his toast? On the dark side. That's pretty good. Now, I wasn't going to do one, but my son said I had to. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> what, do you, what do you call a frog whose car is broken down? A toad. Go. All right. <laughs> you got something? Or is that it? No. Okay, let's hear it for these guys. That took a lot of courage. That took a lot of courage. Good job. Good job. Josh's son is out. <laughs> you, you can see uh, the, the more I have them come up here, the more comfortable they get, uh, which, you know, can be a dangerous thing, I think. But anyway, um, so we are uh, obviously continuing our our. Radical Jesus series. We've been, uh, we've talked politics, we've talked immigration um, and refugees, uh, and we've just talked kind of the general sense of we, we're in a very divided time. We're in a political cycle um, that is that is um, probably not going to resolve the, the the deep divide that we're experiencing. And so, you know, among the the issues, among the the things that we have left to really cover, um, we, uh, we obviously can't do, we, we don't want the tensions to run too deep when, when the kids are here with us. So um, I got kind of, uh, I think this is an important issue, but I, I, we, we wanted to kind of release the, heat, the, the pressure valve a little bit uh, today. And, and so the, the, the issue I chose to spoke, speak about today is how, uh, how families, how we and, and our families engage in digital media usage. I, I'll say this a couple times a day. I, I'm really convinced that digital media usage is a discipleship issue. Um, so today, we're going to get really practical on, on hopefully inviting you and challenging you to think about how we use screens in our life. And so I'll tell you this, kids, um, I'm your friend. I'm probably not your best friend today because of, of the things that we actually really need to talk about, about our kids using uh, social media and, and digital media. But I'll say this, kids, too. Um, I'm probably not your parents' best friend today either because there are very deep implications for uh, adults, uh, whether you have kids or, or whether you're single in the room today. Um, that being said, uh, kids, I love that you're here. I love, actually really love that we do every fifth Sunday, uh, we do a family worship Sunday, just reminding us that like, kids don't have a junior Holy Spirit right? Like, we don't have to dumb the lessons down. We may have to put the cookies, so to speak, on the bottom shelf, but the Holy Spirit is very much active uh, in and through our kids, and, and the, it's not an add-on or it's not a, an addendum that we invite our kids. It's very intentional as a church that we say that we have kids in our worship space, like engaging in the opening worship, and, and I love that. I know it, it brings some complications. Maybe some of you are used to having kids checked in before any of church starts, I actually really love standing next to my boys with, with our arms outreach to Father God um, as a family. And so anyway, it, it, this fifth Sunday is just an attempt for us to like just invite our kids and say, like, kids are a part of the family of God, and we want them um, in our, our, our worship gatherings as well. So, so, two things were born in the fall of 2010. Uh, my oldest son, John... Uh, and the iPad, both new to the world in 2010. 
Uh, at first, the, the iPads seem like such a great idea, right? It's kind of like a magazine in your hands, or it's kind of like the internet without an, an attached keyboard. Um, and so there are many people in the world like me who were juggling kids and screens at a whole new level. Like the, the iPhone had been out, smartphones had been out for three plus years, but this was an additional device. People were able to carry it around. They had a lot of times two devices, as I actually still do today, and a family to figure out how does our family engage with the digital world. Uh, it was all brand new. We were making it up as we go. And in a lot of ways, this is so brand new to the human experience, we are still making it up as we go. You may just, just not realize it. So there were games to play, there were shows to watch, and there was social media to keep up with on the iPad. Now, that was for me, not for John. He didn't have any accounts and still doesn't. Um, now, I want to show you this picture. Here's John, about 15 months in our living room, and the iPad is propped up on the, the coffee table, and I think he looks cute. I think, you know, sorry, John, I think you still look cute. But anyway, handsome, <laughs> handsome, my bad. Um, he's a cute kid, right? Big blue eyes looking at the world with amazement, and I have to get some stuff done sometimes, folks. Dishes, email, you know, in passing to say hi to his mom every once in a while. So I'm like, here's an iPad. Here's Curious George, have fun, right? Nobody knew any better. And so about a dozen or so years later, here we sit, and we know a little bit more. Research has come in, right? Research about um, what, what screens do to attention spans, especially with kids. Uh, there's a book written recently called The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt. It's a must read for you, either you have kids or not, you, you got to get this book. I'll quote from him, not from the book, but later on I'll quote him. Um, he, he's done a lot of research about play-based childhood versus, versus screen-based childhood and what it's doing to the mental health of kids in particular. Um, the self-harm ideation, the isolation, the aggression, I mean, we, th this is such a, a, a crisis right now that we cannot ignore it. We have to pay attention to it. And I know talking about digital media in church may seem like, you know, just teach us the Bible. Newsflash, they didn't have it in the first century ancient Near East. We actually have to pull, not maybe from Scripture, literally, what did Jesus have to say about Netflix and Facebook, but we have to pull from the wisdom of the Spirit. And that's what we're going to do today. So it may seem like, ah, this is kind of a stretch, and I don't know if I agree. That's okay. I want to be more descriptive and ask some really, I want to invite us to ask some, some probing questions of our digital media use, particularly in our families and in our church community. And I, I want us to start answering, if we haven't started to answer these questions for ourselves, because this is such a discipleship issue for us. So, the research is in, it's downright shocking what screens in our pockets and on demand are doing to our mental health and to our relationships. So, again, I'm not coming at you wagging my finger, I'm coming at you as a fellow traveler, trying to navigate this as a dad and as a church leader, and try and like hold tension where there's tension, but really be clear about the danger when that the research and, and when my own kind of experience as a dad, husband, and, and leader um, have bearing on that. Okay, I want I want us to deeply consider how much of a discipleship issue it is. How we consume digital media shapes how and we how we worship God. The ways in which we use our phones, tablets, computers, and other screens has an impact on who we are and forms our spiritual maturity and therefore our faithfulness to how we live into the way of Jesus, okay? So let me ask you this. Let's ask ourselves. What do you call something that's not healthy for us, but we can't quite seem to part with it? We tell ourselves, I know this isn't good for me and I don't really love it, but everyone else is doing it, and I'm afraid if I stop, I won't look cool. You might call that an addiction, right? 
I think most of us call it social media, actually. <laughs> so Jonathan Haidt, he wrote a, uh, in the New York, New York Times recently, Gen Z has regrets. Okay, here's what he says. This is kind of long, so hang with me. Was social media a good invention? One way to quantify the fact, uh, the value of a product, is to find out how many of the people who use it wish it had never been invented. Feelings of regret or resentment are common with addictive products, cigarettes, for example, and addictive activities like gambling, even if most users say they enjoy them. For non-addictive products, hair, hair brushes, say, or bicycles, walkie-talkies, or ketchup, it's rare to find people who use the product every day, yet wish it could be banished from the world. For most products, those who don't like the product can simply not use it. By 2020, more than half of all humans were using some form of social media. So if this were any normal product, we'd assume that, we'd assume that people love it and are grateful to the companies that provide it to them, without charge no less. But it turns out that it can be hard for people who don't like social media to avoid it because when everyone else is in on it, is on it, the abstainers begin to miss out on information, trends, and gossip. Oh my. Gen Z does not heavily regret the basic communication, storytelling, and information-seeking functions of the internet, but responses were different for the main social media platforms that parents and Gen Z itself worried about the most. Many respondents wish these products had never been invented. Instagram, 34%. Facebook, 37%. Snapchat, 43%. And the most regretted platforms of all, TikTok, 47%. And X slash Twitter, 50%. Staggering, isn't it? And you all, like, is there anybody who would disagree with this? Is, is there anybody who really goes, you know, my life is so much better off? with my, fo my face glued to a screen and me feeling disconnected from people and my anxiety triggered at no <laughs> on short notice, right? I know that's a stereotype and oversimplification, but man, this is just staggering. When you, st when you take a step back and you actually ask the question, do I actually like this? I is my life better because of it? And do I just wish I could have skipped this whole thing altogether, right? So there's something bubbling amongst our younger generations and, and the older generation, Gen X and, and above, we feel it, right? There's a recognized pull towards digital media use, especially social platforms, while also regret being formed as usage hours are being racked up. So, again, let's turn to Scripture. Scripture doesn't directly address this, but in a roundabout way. Jesus gets to the heart of the issue. The thing that is being monetized is your time and your attention. At the end of the day, when you use a free social media product, you are what's being paid for, whether or not you know it. People are buying your attention, which means they're buying your time. Now, I know, tinfoil hats, right? Break it out. But I'm serious. When you can't figure out what the commodity is, you are the commodity. You are what's being consumed. Your time, your attention, it's what's being bought in the form of advertising dollars so people sell stuff back to you that you never really wanted, but you think everybody else is using. Okay. So Jesus speaks to both time and especially attention. Here's what he says, okay? Matthew 6, verse 19 says this. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths, moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Okay, usually, pause here. Usually, this uh, is read in the context of money because Jesus is going to get into something we all have heard and we know is true. We say it to each other. Even, even people outside the church that don't know that Jesus originated this say that where your heart is, your treasure is. Where your treasure is, your heart is, right? Everybody everywhere knows that. It's usually in the form of, uh, of money. But I think there's something deeper that Jesus is actually touching on here, right? It's actually what, what the money buys and what our heart is, is, is going towards, okay? Here, here he continues. For where your treasure is, your heart will also be. Then he says this directly afterward. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? 
In other words, Jesus is saying, what your attention is drawn to, what you give your attention to, your heart will be pulled towards. You will invest your treasure in that. Whatever your attention leads out with, your heart and your money, your time, what you give uh, yourself to will follow. So let, your, let the light in your eyes, what you focus your attention on, let that be full of light. Let it be good, healthy, affirming things, life-giving things, things filled with the Spirit and wisdom and truth and goodness and beauty. But if your eyes are drawn towards darkness and you bring that darkness in your body and you think that's light, how dark is that darkness that's telling you it's light, it's lying to you? I mean, I think, like in a lot of ways, this sums up the trends of social media and digital usage. People telling themselves what they're looking at is helpful, but it's so dark, that's all they know, and they're, they're being twisted and lying even to themselves about those things. Now, let me hit pause. I am obviously preaching from an iPad <laughs> next to a table with an iPhone, being streamed on Facebook with screens on each side of me, okay? This could be cognitive dissonance if you hear me saying, we got to get rid of this stuff. We, the stuff I have in my hands, I have with my watch on my other, like I get this. I am not saying for the vast majority of us that we have to flee because this is so evil. Now, I've known people that need a dumb phone because they feel so sucked in and tempted by what they're seeing on their screen. And I get that. I know people who say, yeah, I don't have any social media. Usually they have kind of a smug little grin at the corner of their mind. You know them, right? <laughs> Bless your hearts. Bless your hearts. Now, no, respect. that That's, you, that's cool. I'm, I'm okay with that. But for the vast majority of us, Pandora's box is already open. You sit at screens, a lot of you, a lot of your day to work. How are you going to flee a screen when it's the tool that your company has given you to work on? Now, there has been a lot of good done by social media. Again, we're streaming to Facebook. It will later be on YouTube, right? There's a lot of good that's being done because of, like, the Romans road of digital media. We're able to get the message of Jesus out to people. People that sit are at home who can't make it to church for whatever, whatever reason or they're traveling and they need to watch later— there is blessings here. I'm not saying we just like swear it all off and be done with it. What I am saying is that we have to be wise and discerning and ask the question, who am I becoming when I use this? It's not as much, is this good or bad? There's, there's, there's a lot of things in this world that can be summed up in a binary. This is good, this is bad. But there are also a lot of things it's not that clear. It's, more, it's less a problem to be solved and attention to be managed. And we ask ourselves the question, when I use this social media service, who am I becoming? Am I becoming a person of peace and love and joy? Uh, I think half the people that use Twitter are saying, nope, that's not me, right? There's a lot of people who use digital media and they look at the time invested. I mean, every Sunday, I, I, don't, I don't know why it gets here on Sunday, but every Sunday I get a screen time report right before church, in fact. It's kind of like, well, there's, you know, it's like you go through your week and go, I feel pretty good. Like I walked in step with the Spirit. You look at your screen time. Well, there's my repentance right there. <laughs> there it is. Oh, Lord, take some communion and be repentant about like screen time suckage. You know what I mean? Like, we, we need to be aware of these things. And the screen time usage report is there because the CEOs and higher-ups at these companies know that this is a problem. Many of them will not even let their children have these devices. That we, I mean, I remember last year, John was in seventh grade. The first week of school, he came home with an iPad. I'm like, okay, you know, we, yeah, great. I'm Good tool. And then he would kind of disappear for the next hour of the of time. And I'm like, okay, where'd he go? He was watching YouTube because they sent home, before they were able to give us like parental guidance apps, 
he was able to just like, hop, and you know, I'm sorry, John, I don't mean to shame you. Like, he's a kid, of course. He's going to like, dude, I can watch YouTube shorts all afternoon because like this is non-restricted. Like being aware of what's going on, even sometimes in our own home or like the, the schools aren't as caught up or I'm not as caught up on all the usage or all the uh, access points, things like that. We just have to be discerning and wise and know we're going to make mistakes and there's grace. There's room as long as our eyes are filled with light. Because what we pay attention to, we are willing to pay for. What we pay attention to, oftentimes, is what is getting our time, our affection, our resources, our money. Here's what John Mark Comer says in Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. What you give your attention to is the person you become. Put another way, the mind is the portal to the soul, and what you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, your life is no more than the sum of what you gave your attention to. That bodes well for those apprentices of Jesus who give the bulk of their attention to him and to all that is good, beautiful, and true in his world, but not for those who give their attention to the 24-7 news cycle of outrage and anxiety and emotion-charged drama or the nonstop feed of celebrity gossip, titillation, and cultural drivel. As if we give in to it in the first place, much of it is stolen by a clever algorithm out to monetize our precious attention. Again, tinfoil hat, but it's true. Like, we sit here and think, like a lot of conversations in my house, uh, over the last couple of years have been, do you understand, do I understand, there are Ivy League graduates, MIT graduates at the top level of these companies that are ever tweaking an algorithm to take, to, 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 to trick me into giving them my, my attention so that they can sell it to ad companies so they can sell their product back to me. Do I have any chance to go up to these Ivy League grads where they won't even give these devices to their own kids and have them in their own homes for their families to use? Do I stand a chance in middle America? The answer would be no, unless you are filled with the Spirit. Honestly, I am not that smart. I mean, there are, there are more days than I can count that at the end of my day, I am so tired. My mind is tired and my body is like, well, we're still good, right? I've got another couple hours in me. And I lay there on the couch and I scroll mindlessly. That's when they get you the most. It's when you're the most tired and your, your walls are down and your willpower, that muscle has all been used by the trials of the day. Man, that's how they get you. And like, you know, another midnight, 1230, or later, no judgment on anybody, especially me, right? Grace. <laughs> Comes there, and I'm like, they got me again. How'd that happen? How did that happen? Five minutes turns into an hour and a half. What? I'm not that smart. We are not that smart, except if we walk in step with the Spirit and our eyes are filled with light, what we put in front of us, we, we have the, the sensitivity to the Spirit to feel the nudge of like, do you really need that right now? Why don't you put that down right now? Why don't you do something else? Why don't you do something more life giving Hey, man, go to bed. Like, have you ever heard the Spirit just go, dude, go to bed? Maybe not dude, you know, but it's like, go to bed. Get up, go to the gym, start fresh tomorrow. Like, sometimes you're just too tired, right? But that's the point. Staying in step and then having, at the end, we'll talk about actually some good practices to have. When your willpower is zapped, when, you're, when your sons are asking for another hour of screen time in addition to what they've already had, some good practices to put in place so there's already some scripts, there's already some decisions made on the front end. So you're not up at 12.30 going, ah, how this happened, they got me again, right? Okay, so what you give your attention to is what you give your affection to. And what you give your attention to is who you eventually end up becoming, okay? Here, here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3. It says this, verse 17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. God knew digital media, social media, screens, and endless scrolling was going to be a problem, right? This is not a surprise. Where the Spirit is, there is freedom. There is freedom from these, these messes, these problems, these tensions, Okay? 
And we who are with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Mainly, Paul is saying, what we behold, we become. Okay? You've heard it said, you become like the five closest friends that you have, the, the people in your life, the five people that you spend the most time with, right? You become like them, right? You pick up their, their, their habits, you, you rise to the level of their, however high they're aiming in life, you, you sometimes stumble the same thing as they stumble at, you pick up the same language, maybe you start dressing the same, you, you become like them in character in a lot of different ways, That's because we're impressionable even when we don't think what we are. What you give your attention to, you become like. Who you behold, you become. That's why the the, the Scripture is full of admonitions to to, uh, be in the Word and reflect and meditate on the Bible. All throughout the Psalms, the psalmist, King David and other psalmists are saying, I love to meditate on your Word day and night because David had a hunger to become like God to to, uh, embody God's character on earth. Now, the problem is what we're beholding oftentimes in forms of up to four to seven hours a day is the screens in front of us. And, And there's no even ability to be bored and reach for something else. Like I would find myself, I made some changes here recently, I would find myself at the grocery store, self checkout line, man, it's rolling 10 deep. Well, what do I have to do other than just instinctively pull out my phone, see if someone emailed me, if I have a shiny bobble next to a social media app, or I'm just bored, so I just endlessly scroll to see what's going on in the world. Some important things, but mostly not important things pertaining to me. I'll just <laughs> be honest with you. But the instinctive, I'll just pull my phone out. I'm bored. I have, I have a moment. I have two minutes. I have ten minutes of time. I'm sitting in traffic. I'm waiting on a friend. We just instinctively do this, reflexively do this. And it's stealing. Really, it is. We're allowing it to steal moments of our time and our attention and our focus. How do we reach for God's Word when we instinctively, reflexively just reach for our phones to scroll endlessly? Again, there is no condemnation. Like, if you're feeling like, dude, like, ease up a bit. I, I'm mainly just, like, telling you my life, honestly. If you resonate, you resonate. If you don't, God bless you. We, we need more of you. Anyway, what you behold, you will become. The question is, what are you beholding? What are you meditating and contemplating? Okay? So, if that's true, if you buy into that, and... If you need help, like me, what do we do about this? So I want to give you just a a few practical things, okay? Um, Engaging in digital media, especially as as it affects our kids and the next generation. Um, I want you to know this. We've already talked about this a little bit. But your attention has been hijacked. You need to reclaim your attention. You need to do what you can to reclaim focus and concentration it's a muscle. I know I, I, that I have people with ADHD in my life and neurodivergence and you just, you know, they love Jesus and they're desperate for like, how do I do this? I'm telling you, digital media does not help. It exacerbates, okay? Re, uh, I want you to read this quote with me. Jonathan Harari, he wrote a book called Stolen Focus that is another just must read. Uh, he wrote an article in The Guardian and he says this, A neuroscientist at Massachusetts MIT explained, your brain can only process one or two thoughts in your conscious mind at once. That's it. But we have fallen for an enormous delusion. The average teenager now believes they can follow six forms of media at the same time. When neuroscientists study this, they found that when people believe they are doing several things at once, they're actually juggling which is known as the switch cost effect. This means that if you check your text while trying to work, you aren't only losing the little bursts of time you spend looking at the text themselves, you're also losing the time it takes to refocus afterwards, which turns out to be a huge amount. For example, one study at Carnegie Mellon University's Human Computer Interaction Lab took 136 students and got them to sit uh, a test. He's, I think, British, so that doesn't make sense. Sit at a test. Take a test. Um, Some of them had to have their phones switched off, and others 
had their phones on and receives, received intermittent text messages. It's like a normal work day, right? The students who received messages performed on average 20% worse. Because that's you, you score perfect, and that 20% ding is like you're down to an 80. That's two letter grades, barely hanging on, almost into a third letter grade, right? 20% worse. It seems to me that almost all of us are currently losing that 20% of our brain power almost all the time. We now live in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation. That means it's making you stupider when you're not stupider. (laughs) Right? It it means if, I'm telling you, think about this. That means if you want to do better. Now, uh, we love people that are out there. We love people. We we believe people. There's not just this like, uh, zero-sum game that we're living in the world. We believe there's not just a piece of pie or a pie and we get more or less. But let's just, that, like, we also live in a world where it is competitive, okay? So just hang with me for a second. Imagine that if you were up for a promotion and, if, and you had somebody else that, you know, a couple people were applying for the promotion or up for it too or you're up for a bonus or whatever it is and you go, if I could just show that I was hungry and capable, I'd do it. And the solution, the easy solution that it would take for you is turn your phone off during the day. Boom, 20% better. 20% better. Just the more fuller capacity of you. If you want, like think of it like this. If you want your kids to be competitive in the workplace, the next generation, the best thing that you can do for them is to turn off their phones or even just delay a smartphone altogether. Don't give it to them during the school day. They're fine. They're fine. They have adults watching after them all the time. They don't need you. What would you like for dinner? No, you figure it out later, right? Because those little interactions during the day, and we do it too, it's costing all of us 20% of our brain power. And it's so easy if we could just use some restraint, right? You want better grades? I really do think this would be more money in your bank account, more concentration, Better social interactions, right? The, the gamut, okay? That's point one. You have to take your attention back because it's been hijacked, okay? The average adult has their phone within, no, uh, the, the average adult, 91% of, of Americans have their phone within arm's reach all times during the day. I'm doing it right now. You're probably doing it right now. It's our, it's our lived reality, and it's making us dumber, Okay? All right, second, okay? This is for the children. Children, I want you to know, the internet is forever. I can't imagine. I was born, I'll just say, I was born in the 70s, all right, y'all? I can't imagine, I can't imagine today trying to get uh, jobs and launch out on a career having decades of internet history on me. I mean, Again, parents, you want your your kids to have a leg up in the labor market? Don't let them have 20 years of little funny TikTok dances because their recruiters are looking at that stuff. I'm serious. Kids, the internet is forever. The stupid meme that you post, the inflammatory opinion that you have that's probably going to change when your full brain capacity comes online at 25, Having decades of of traceable things to you. I mean, I think a lot of people are going to have to have name changes in the future or something like that just to escape. Like, I can't, but like, it's kind of funny right now because Facebook's still, I I know it's old, but it's still really young to to go, what did 25-year-old me post? It was like, oh, I was so dumb. But you know what? I'm pretty deep into a career. Like, not much of that. Like, I was dumb, but like, not that dumb. You know what I mean? I wasn't 15. I wasn't, I wasn't 10 posting stuff like that. I can't imagine today what it's like with that internet history pointed to you trying to think about a future thing that you want to launch. So the best way to do it is to not do it at all. Yeah, your friends are going to post some funny memes. You know what? You're going to be Teflon in a few years, and they're going to be like deleting their history. The internet is forever. Kind of related to that, I just want you to know Privacy is for your diary if you're a kid. Privacy is for your diary. There's no such thing as internet privacy in our home, right? Like, our our kids, they may not fully know this or fully even be able to tell you, but, like, 
I tell them that they have these smartphones that are so locked down, they're like dumb phones, and we got them these things. And I said, this is my phone. I'm letting you borrow this. Your name pops up with, associated with a number. But this is our phone, me and your mom's. And we get to, this is a privilege for you to be able to borrow this, and we get to look at this anytime we feel like. So yeah, we have internet surveillance in our home. It's called Dad. I am unashamed of that, all right? I am unashamed. My, now, my kids are good. They're good. But they're really good at workarounds, too. So I have to be on my toes. I mean, you guys are smart. You know you are. They're smart. I have to be even smarter. And it's a, it's a race, right? And that's okay. As long as we're working together and we understand, I'm dad, your kid, and we're figuring out th- this out together, okay? So privacy, y'all, privacy kid, kiddos, is for your diary. And anytime your parents go, I need to see your device, unless you're paying for it, which you probably won't until you're in your 20s or whatever, it's theirs, okay? All right. Um, and then third, and here's where I really want to go today. Here's where I re- actually really want to land. Maintaining a set of practices for digital media use. I think the most life-giving thing that we've done is um, we, we've taken this rule of life that our church has developed on the back door, it's on our website too, um, and baked into that are questions about digital media usage. So what I would encourage, even today, as I go through, I have a set of questions I'm going to ask that you just think about, maybe adopt for yourselves, to ask yourselves these questions to know how you intend to engage with social and particularly, well, with digital media and particularly with social media, okay? To have a set of practices to give a budget to your time and in particular your attention so that you can follow the way of Jesus, so that you can worship him and not have your attention constantly divided to all the dings and all the vibrations that are going off in your pocket, okay? So to maintain a set of practices, I just call it a digital rule of life that you can have as a subset of, of a rule of life if you're, if you're practicing that, which I would, would encourage and suggest. You could take this out and set it on its own and even go through it with your family or your roommates or your spouse or whoever, okay? So here are some questions that I would encourage you to have and, and to ask yourselves and each other, okay? You can design your rule of life by asking this. Are there times of the day when screens will not be used, okay? I would encourage to think about parenting your phone, just like you do your, your kids. Your kids don't go to bed when you do. Your kids probably don't get up when you do, right? You put your kids to bed earlier than you go to bed, so you can have some downtime. And you probably get up earlier to get your day started, and then your kids get up. I think that's a, a great uh, uh, practice for your phone. Is there a point at which I'm going to put my phone away and have screen-free time? And is there time in the morning that I can have and maybe be devoted to a little bit of slowness, a little bit of solitude, and maybe even some prayer with God before my phone wakes up and starts dinging at me, okay? Are there certain environments where screens are not used, such as like the bedroom? Like I think it's a good practice to not have your phone in the bedroom if you can, so you can sleep a restful night without things going off. Now, for some of us, our alarms are our phones, For me, I have my phone across the room. It's plugged in on my dresser. There's no way I'm going to roll over and in the middle of the night see a screen shining at me and want to get on there at 3 a.m. and scroll Twitter, okay? I'm not saying it's never happened. I'm just saying it's not regularly going to happen, okay? Is there something like that that you can do? Our kids, we have a device drawer in our kitchen for iPads and the kids' phones. They get tucked in. Um... There are, um, for our kids, and I'll I'll mention this here in a minute, our kids are not allowed to have screens in their room, which is not a good practice. We're not going to do that. They tuck their phones in at night and go to bed, okay? Um, Are there dinners, uh, other meals with friends? I've heard of, you know, friends going out, and they put their phones in the middle, and the friend that checks their phone first has to pick up the tab, or at least, not in this economy, I would say the appetizer, let's be honest, Right? (laughs) You might try that, it's like, and, and how to have engaging conversations, because if you go to most refer- restaurants, most people are sitting around the table on their phones. It's kind of dissonance, it's incongruent to say, we are the most lonely generation, and we are the most plugged-in generation. Like, those two things coexist right now, and they shouldn't. It's like cause and effect, right? Anyway, 
I'm telling you, phones are making us dumb. There you go, 20% dumber right there. Um, what kinds of focus apps and screen use monitoring will I use, will my family use? I went almost nuclear this, this couple of weeks ago. I looked at my screen time. I looked at the, the time during the day of like me just checking email, like faking productivity. Like, you know, checking email like 10 times a day is just fake productivity, right? It's actually just boredom. Like, I wonder who emailed me. Like, my emer- their emergency needs to be- become my emergency in that moment, right? So, I, I installed a couple apps to just block stuff during my high energy and my high concentration moments. So, like, 10 to 2 every day, I can't get to email. I can't get to Facebook. Like, I, I can't. I just can't do it because I installed this couple apps on my laptop and my phone that will not give me access. It feels good. I'm just telling you. It's, there's so much freedom in going, well, I really need to like post on Facebook for church. Yeah, right, right? Like, come on. I can't do it. I have to wait. I have to like plan for it. I have to like pick up a physical book and read it sometimes because just everything's shut down. It's the most freeing thing. Now, I know that may not apply to you all the time in every way, but I would really encourage like, what apps do you need to have to really go this route, to, to take your attention and your time back, okay? Um, at what age will our kid, you might even take a screenshot of that. that, that is allowed, okay? No one will shame you if you pull your phone out and start taking pictures to remember stuff, okay? That's allowed. At what age will our kids be allowed, uh, 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 what age will our kids be allowed a smartphone? At what age? You and, and your spouse, you and your future spouse need to actually, like, think about that, um, at what age will our kids be allowed social media? Lot, lots of research. I mean, you, you can't go into this blind. There's research now saying, like, it's just such a, there are actually laws that under the age of 14 that, that youth accounts aren't allowed on some platforms, but the research is actually saying it's, it's uh, uh, younger than 16. It's just such a tragic and uh, 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 mistake to allow teens to be on social media. I told you kids, I'm your friend. I'm not your best friend today, okay? But that's the reality. Um, at what age will our kids be allowed social media? Will our kids be allowed screens in their bedrooms? Um, and and I, I don't even mean to insinuate that bad things are happening on the phones after dark. I'm just saying the time and attention where kids are, are you know, in the dark with the screens on at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., texting friends, it just is an attention suck, and there's get, they're getting less and less sleep. So I don't even mean there to be some kind of like bad thing. That are, you, you could have such a trustworthy kid, but they're getting sucked into this cycle of like time and attention suck at, in the middle of the night. Uh, how many hours a day will our kids use digital media? How many hours a day will the adults in our house use digital media? Okay? Will digital media be a de facto right in our house, or will it be earned through adding household value? One of the best things we did was actually really decide there's a hard start this past summer, and it continues on, hard start at 3 p.m. to any kind of screen time. Okay? Maybe music is the only like allowable thing, but not looking at a screen sucked into that. Hard start. And to do that, you need to have these chores done in our house. Kitty litter, pets fed, pets watered, clothes folded, things picked up, dishes empty, dishes. You have to earn this right to have screen time instead of just, because I know how it is. I've been doing this for almost 14 years. I know how it is when you're tired and your kid is like, hey, entertain me or interact with me and you hand them a screen. I have to break up with that just like, here, entertain yourself. So as much for me being creative as a dad and interacting with my own kids as it is to protect the kids and their sense of entitlement to say, no, you're not, you have to earn the right for screen time. You don't deserve it by any long shot, okay? So, and then finally, are certain media forms preferred, i.e. long form storytelling over short form clips? Here's what I mean by this. This is so subtle. Um, How many of you, Get sucked into the YouTube shorts or the instant. Don't raise your hand. Um, <laughs> don't want to invite that smoke on your life, you know. Uh, Instagram reels, and you just like scroll and you scroll and you scroll, okay? Now imagine, imagine a kid doing that and what it does. You know what it does to your attention span. Imagine what it does to a kid's attention span. So what I tell my kids is, okay, you want to watch YouTube shorts, you watch it here within earshot or right next to me. 
Because I trust you, I don't trust you too. That's what I say. That's how I lead almost every conversation. Isn't that right, guys? I trust you. I do not trust the internet, okay? You sit here, and you can do shorts. You can do it for 15 minutes, and then I want you to put a show on. You know, where there's an introduction, and there's tension, and there's a plot, and it hopefully resolves. You know, like storytelling. Not these five-second, like, just watching it like the zombie apocalypse could happen all around you, and you're so locked in you wouldn't even notice. Like the attention, anyway, that's why. Are there certain um, uh, digital media forms that are preferred over others? So that, that is the beginning of a digital rule of life. Things to ask yourself, what do I prefer? What am I going to resist? What fights are really worth fighting? And I'm telling you, it's an ideal that you set out for yourself and your family. It's not something that you're going to achieve all the time, but there is grace there's grace. And I, I just really would encourage you, you make the decision on the front end, and you're shifting the culture in your house when you stick to it. And so, like, I shared the, um, a couple weeks ago, I shared our summer. Like, our summer is great. We had one of the best summers I think we've ever had. Um, it wasn't perfect. There's lots of stuff going on. But our kids, we live around the block from the Hill of Guys. And our kids were both just old enough. We have a, a a neighborhood pool they could both walk to, opens up at one o'clock, screen time's at three that they know, you know, we've got a convenience store down the road. They had a 1980s childhood, as best as I could give it to them, because they were just let loose feral into the neighborhood, <laughs> and it was wonderful. Like, both had bikes, and they, could, they would ping to the Hill of Guys house, a couple of their kids would come over to our house hang out, play marbles, play Uno, exploding kittens, whatever. Um, they'd sneak in some Zelda a little bit. I'm like, all right, kids, you're, you know, I'm a, like the fun uncle. I'm trying to be, you know, like, all right, you can have a little bit of screen time. That's fine. Um, and then they would ping back to somebody else's house. They'd go get a snack at the convenience store. And they were just like, they'd go to, they'd go and see if their friend was at home. In the, like, do you remember that? Remember when we'd go to somebody's house to see if they were home? We'd like do a, dr- a swing by. I'm like, yeah, I remember that. Go do that. Go just do that. And if their parents have a problem, just text, have them text me, you know? And it was great. And they, I think, were just given so much freedom that they haven't had. They really enjoyed it, too. I enjoyed giving them permission. They enjoyed having the permission. And it, it was really great. What, and I just so happened to be reading The Anxious Generation that talked about the dichotomy between the screen-free childhood. You know, remember the 80s where your, your parents just, if you're, if you're Gen, Gen X or Millennial, like your parents would just let you go into the neighborhood and not know where you were for a couple hours. You remember how you survived that? Remember, remember how you're okay now and you're probably better for that? I'm like, I want that for my kids as much as I'm able. So yeah, they had a like smartphone, dumb phone where I could kind of see where they were, but sometimes they would forget their phone and Sarah and I would look at each other like, are they gonna be okay if we don't know where they are? You know what? There they are. They're fine. It's, it's fine. I don't mean to be dim- dismissive or whatever, but it's like they made it. They, yeah, they, there were a couple bike accidents. I got some thumbs up there. I'll take those. There were a couple bike accidents where kids hobbled home, you know, and it's like, here's some ice cream. You're, gonna, you're doing great and you'll be fine. You know, that was the dad pep talk. They're fine. They're fine. And it was wonderful. And so if I could encourage you, it, it may be, our, our culture frowns on this, but I'm telling you, we need to push back and let our kids have freedom and let us have freedom, even as adults. Like, there's a thing that people are reclaiming these days called walks without their phones. Like, people just leave their house and go on a, rock, a walk and they leave their phone at home. Can you imagine? Like, can you imagine? <laughs> people feeling the freedom to, like, leave their phone in the car and go to a coffee shop with some cash and just sit and have coffee without a screen. Can you imagine what that does for you? Yeah, you're a little anxious right now. Like if you're feeling anxious, by the way, like, oh, I could never do. Like there's hope for you. There's probably some counseling for you too. (laughs) We love you. We're all there with you. You kind of got hives thinking about a digital rule of life, putting my phone to bed. Oh my God. You know, we love you. We're here for you. Uh, But can you imagine the freedom that you would feel if you could actually do this? To shut your laptop, to leave your iPad, and just go out in the world and like see what's out there? It's it's a magical place, y'all. It really is. So with that, 
I'll have you stand. Um, because at the end of the day, this is really about giving you back your freedom. It's really helping you understand that you don't have to be tied to a screen to be happy. I'll have the worship team and the community servers come on up too. What, what could you do with the average of four to seven hours a day? How would your life be different if you could just not look at it that much? If you could maybe have it, maybe take 90% of that time back, what could you, what would you invent? What problems could you solve? What people could you actually help around you if you just shut your phone off and engage with the people around you? That's what we're really talking about, okay? So here's the question. I want to give you just an invite to put this into practice. How could a digital rule of life benefit you, benefit your family, and what questions do you need to ask yourselves to live in this kind of freedom, okay? So, um, at, at the conclusion of every gathering, we receive the Lord's, prayer, uh, Lord's uh, Supper, and we recite the Lord's Prayer together. So, again, I realize I'm going to read from a screen, and you're going to read from a screen. My challenge as we go forward is, maybe we could memorize this and do it from our heart, right? Like, just the little steps of those things, taking out the crutches that we use, that I use, I would love to see our church be that kind of church, okay? So, but no judgment if you're not there today. Let's say the Lord's Prayer.